and looked at as, you know, a famous, you know, like R. Kelly was. So it's intimidating, you know. It's not your uncle this time, it's R. Kelly, a Grammy winner. So who's gonna believe you? You're a gold digger, you're after money, it didn't happen, you were a groupie, or you were looking to be taken advantage of because you knew who you were getting into, like you deserved it. So it, it's hard, it's a difficult step to take. And yet here we are, you've created a series that has created space and given voice to black women who were not heard. Um, and we're here at this uh, media festival with industry people who are grappling with the idea, the concept of inclusion and representation in this industry. I have to say, I've never been in my 15 years in the business part of a panel where I'm interviewing four women, four black women who occupy different spots on a production, both at the executive level, on the producer level, and in front of the camera. This is a model for how our industry can move forward. Can you speak to that? How many of this kind of team are you seeing in your industry? And what can the people in this room take from your example to their respective workplaces to create more of what we're seeing here today? I think it just starts by asking. You know, I come from NBC Universal at a time when Jeff Sucker was there and he had a right hand of diversity. That was his right, his left and the right. All of Madison was his right. And the demand for diversity and inclusion behind the camera, in front of the camera, was something that was instilled in all executives from, from the start. And um, everyone was accountable by member. You know, so when Paul Madison called, you know, people come to what does she want? I don't know, call her back and say, I have no idea what she wants that in her head. Um, but I think for this particular project, it made sense for a black woman to tell a black woman's story. So that's, that's sort of an easy get, um, which is why we ended up going to Dream um, to run the documentary, because she's a brave black woman. And so I think for us behind the camera, it's just about asking the question, you know, who else is there? You know, I just had a meeting where we were trying to decide a production company um, for a particular project, and I think there were five different um, production companies that met and did the pitch for the project. Um, but the project happens to be an African American celebrity, and to not have, you know, um, a woman or man of color in the room, um, you know, buying for the spot as well didn't seem like it sit well. So I said, okay, so we need some more. These are great options, and we need to see a couple more. And I think it's as simple as asking for it, because sometimes people aren't pushed to. When you're going to your go-to folks, your showrunners that you know are going to knock it out of the park, it's a small class of people. You know? But if someone pushes back and says, but I need you to look a little further, you look a little further. And I think we interviewed people around town, like 50 people before the next dream. Oh, oh my gosh, gosh. when they said, drink it up. They said, drink it up to accept it. So, oh, thank you. Thank you, God, because it was tough. It was your 50th choice. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, you would have been the first. Like, you, know? Um, I, you know, I don't think that you have to be a hobbit to make Lord of the Rings. Um, but I do think that, you know, I didn't like study what I just unpacked to you about post reconstruction um, lynching and you know what happened in the south how my city the city i grew up in became black which was detroit because you had people fleeing post reconstruction era um southern small towns i'm um, not only looking for opportunity but fleeing racial terror that had this underlying um sexual violence yeah. you know these accusations often false of sexual violence right so that is a knowledge that i bring to the project without but not that you can't learn that you can absolutely go and study that any showrunner can learn that, but knowing that, I bring that to the project already. I mean, in the U.S., we, you know, just, I don't want to get too political, but we have, you know, states like Alabama where you, you have all men um, chambers making these ridiculous laws, anti-choice laws, you know, um, 
there was this thing about six weeks, and you have to, so you have these female senators in the, in the floor of the Capitol saying, listen, m most women don't know if they missed their period by then. Like, what are you talking about? But then you look at the photo, the class photo of who just made these laws, and it's all men, you know? Um, so this is why, you know, diversity is, is important. Um, and inclusion is important. It's not just to populate and staff certain areas and to check off certain boxes, but it's to bring more knowledge to the table. Um, and in this case, when you have a really, I, I just, after, you know, wrapping um, Surviving Our Kelly, I worked on another project where, and, and this isn't, I, I didn't mind this, I'm not begrudging this team, but we had to sit down and have kind of like university style classes this was a, a, we were dealing with all kinds of topics of injustice, university style sessions before we could even send that team out to the field, right? Um, and if you have the time to do that, that's fine. But if you have a shorter budget, a shorter timeline, and you need to get focused on the thing at hand, then it's great to have somebody who knows who Eric Heavy is. This is a genre singer. He, does, he, he has one crossover hit. You know, I believe I can fly. For some reason, Ignition was big at Bar Mitzvahs, but I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but, you know, he really belonged to black people. We have some time left now for Q&A. If any of you have any questions for our panel, let us know, and a microphone will be coming around. In this question, uh, coming off of uh, 10 years as a prosecutor in quarters here in, in northern Canada, and I'm curious if the panelists could comment on what the lesson learned is after the experience of doing this series. Is that there's other ways of fact-finding? Are there other ways that we can run a court system and prosecute? Or is the, the lesson more that we have to take what we've learned outside of courts and create change elsewhere. And I'm asking the question also, not in the context of the history of the United States and uh, the, uh, the racial history that you've alluded to, but also in the context in Canada here that the Royal Commission on um, Missing and Murdered Aboriginal Indigenous Women uh, released its report last week and declared our history say that as a Canadian and a settler, that our history is genocide. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm aware of that history. Thank you. Um, there are two things that I, I think about with that. Um, one is, and this speaks to how aware R. Kelly is of his um, own crimes, he, he very much manipulated, and we spent time, when Brie put us on this linear timeline, um, episodes, um, three and four are about the trial. So um, you had someone who, we had a 14 year old victim who he kept close to her, so she never agreed to be a witness against him, but he and his defense team also were able to manipulate the system in a way that they put the actual trial off six years so that should she decide to come forward, she would appear as a 20, 21 year old rather than a 14 year old. Um, so there was a real strategy on his part. Um, the prosecutors actually did, the, I think, the best that they could. They brought forward more than a dozen witnesses who positively ID'd this 14-year-old, including her aunt, including her teachers, including a gym coach, you know. So they did, I, I, I don't, they're, regardless of race, when it comes to sexual and gender violence, there's often not justice in the court system, but these prosecutors really did do their, their jobs. Um, we had a defense attorney after our show aired come out and say that he knew R. Kelly was guilty all along. Um, he was on R. Kelly's team. That um, He's near death right now. He's dying of an illness, of a um, terminal illness, and said that um, in the Chicago Tribune. You can find that online. But as to the second part of your question, I came of an age, um, 
I became political because of South Africa. Um, and, you know, this is at a time when the spouses of members of the ANC, and in particular Winnie Mandela, was going around the world and asking people to boycott companies who continue to do business with apartheid South Africa. So they weren't finding justice in the courts in South Africa, they weren't finding justice in the world courts, but there was a way that we could, you know, boycott, be sanctioned, where we could, there were ways, other ways that we could, you know, bring some justice to this cause. Um, I really liked Oprah's strategy when Don Imus, you know, when, when she began targeting him after he said something racist, it's been used again and again, but she didn't go to Don Imus, who at that point was a 60 plus year old man who knew exactly what she was saying, he was saying. She went to his advertisers. So I think that the campaign of Mute R. Kelly, which existed before our project, which was calling venues and saying, you shouldn't be allowing him to perform at your venue. And if you do, we're gonna boycott you. We're gonna be out front with signs. We're gonna embarrass you. We're gonna shame you. I thought that those were campaigns that deserved support and to be lifted up. Um, we interviewed the founder of Mute R. Kelly in our project. And I thought that strategy outside of a 2008 acquittal was a smart one and continues to be when they also told Spotify and they targeted Spotify and then Sony. Um, I think those are righteous and just campaigns. We have time for one more question. Who's faster? I think, I think she had her hand up from before, sorry. I just have to, first of all, profoundly applaud all of you. I'm seriously thinking about the show. It's a remarkable experience to watch it. I'm a filmmaker. Um, and congratulations to the network, congratulations to the survivors, congratulations to the filmmakers. It was just an absolutely atrociously remarkable experience. I, I couldn't, I can't believe it. So I'm curious, when I was thinking about the explosive impact now, and since you aired, first of all, with the current violent situation in the, in the States, have you experienced any kind of backlash? Are you, are you worried about this? Is this going on? That's one question. The second question is, can you update us as to where things are at right now with him, with the situation, with you all, how everyone is? I'd just really like to know. Um, in terms of, yeah, backlash is hard to talk about, probably a little painful in this moment. There's been a lot of support, and then there's been a lot of trolling. Um, I, in terms of what's 